She is herself with a few people only, and you are one of them, she heard Selden say. And again, be good to her, Gertie, won't you? And she has it in her to become whatever she is believed to be, and you'll help her by believing the best of her? The words beat on Gertie's brain like the sound of a language which had seemed familiar at a distance, but on approaching is found to be unintelligible. He had come to talk to her of Lily. That was all. There had been a third at the feast she had spread for him, and that third had taken her own place. She had tried to follow what he was saying, to cling to her own part in the talk, but it was all as meaningless as the boom of waves in a drowning head. And, she felt, as the drowning may feel, that to sink would be nothing besides the pain of struggling to keep up. Selden rose, and she drew a deep breath, feeling that soon she could yield to the blessed waves. Mrs. Fishers, you're saying she was dining there? There's music afterwards. I believe I had a card from her. He glanced at the foolish pink card, pink-faced clock that was drumming out this hideous hour. A quarter past ten? I might look in there now. The Fisher evenings are amusing. I haven't kept you up too late, Gertie. You look tired. I've rambled on and bored you. And, in the unwanted overflowing of his feelings, he left a cousinly kiss upon her cheek. At Mrs. Fisher's, through the cigar smoke of the studio, a dozen voices greeted Selden. A song was pending as he entered, and he dropped into a seat near his hostess, his eyes roaming in search of Miss Bart. But she was not there, and the discovery gave him a pang out of all proportions to its seriousness, since the note in his breast pocket assured him that at four the next day they would meet. To his impatience, it seemed immeasurably long to wait, and, half ashamed of the impulse, he leaned to Mrs. Fisher to ask, as the music ceased, if Miss Bart had not dined with her. Lily? She's just gone. She had to run off. I forget where. She Wasn't she wonderful last night? Who's that? Lily? asked Jack Stepney from the depths of a neighboring armchair. Really, you know, I'm no prude, but it comes to a girl standing there as if she were up at auction. I thought seriously of speaking to Cousin Julia. You don't know... You didn't know Jack had become our social censor, Mrs. Fisher said to Selton with a laugh, and Stephanie spluttered amid the general derision. But she's a cousin, hang it, and when a man's married, town talk was full of her this morning. Yes, lively, lively reading that was, said Mr. Ned Van Elsing, stroking his mustache to hide the smile behind it. By the dirty sheet? No, of course not. Some fellow showed it to me. But I heard the stories before. When a girl's as good-looking as that, she'd better marry. Then no questions are asked. In our imperfectly organized society, there is no provision as yet for the young woman who claims the privilege of marriage without assuming its obligations. Well, I understand Lily is about to assume them in the shape of Mr. Rosedale, Mrs. Fisher said with a laugh. Rosedale? Good heavens! exclaimed Van Elsting, dropping his eyeglass. Stepney! That's your fault for foisting the brute on us. Oh, conf confound it. You don't know. You know, we don't marry Rosedale in our family, Stephanie languidly protested. But his wife, who sat in oppressive bridal finery at the other side of the room, quelled him with a judicial reflection. In Lily's circumstance, it's a mistake to have too high a standard. I hear even Rosedale has been scared by the talk lately, Mrs. Fisher rejoined. But the sight of her last night sent him off his head. What do you think he said to me after the tableau? My God, Mr. F Mrs. Fisher, if I could get Paul Morpeth to paint her like that, the picture'd appreciate a hundred percent in ten years. By Jove! But isn't she some about somewhere? exclaimed Val Alstein, restoring his glass with an uneasy glance. No, she ran off while you were all mixing the punch downstairs. Where was she going, by the way? What's on tonight? I haven't heard anything. Oh, not a party, I think, said an inexperienced young Farish, who had arrived late. I put her in a cab as I was coming up, and she gave the driver the Trenner's address. The Trenner's, exclaimed Mrs. Jack Stepney. Why, the house is closed. Judy telephoned me from Bellamont this evening. Did she? That's queer. I'm sure I'm not mistaken. Well, come now, Trenner's there anyhow. 
I owe, well, uh, the fact is, I've heard no head for numbers, he broke off, admonished by the nudge of an adjoining foot and the smile that circul circled the room. In its unpleasant light, Selden had risen and was shaking hands with his hostess. The air of the place stifled him, and he wondered why he had stayed in it so long. On the doorstep, he stood still, remembering a phrase of Lily's. It seems to me you spend a good deal of time in the element you disapprove of. Well, what had brought him there but the quest of her? It was her element, not his, but he would lift her out of it, take her beyond, that beyond, on her letter was like a cry for rescue. That beyond on her rest on a letter was like a cry for rescue. He knew that Perseus's task is not done when he had loosened Andromeda's chains, for her limbs are numb with bondage, and she cannot rise and walk, but clings to him with dragging arms as he beats back to land with his burden. Well, he had strength through both. It was her weakness which had put the strength in him. It was not, alas, a clean rush of waves that they had to win through, but a clogging morass of old associations and habits, and, for the moment, its vapors were in his throat. But he would see clearer, breathe freer in her presence. She was at once the dead weight at his breast and the spar which would float them to safety. He smiled at the whirl of metaphor with which he was trying to build up a defense against the influences of the last hour. It was pitiable that he, who knew the mixed motives on which social judgments depend, should still feel himself so swayed by them. How could he lift Lily to a freer vision of life if his own view of her was to be colored by any mind in which he saw her reflected? The moral oppression had produced a physical craving for air, and he strode on, opening his lungs to the reverberating coldness of the night. At the corner of Fifth Avenue, Van Elstein hailed him with an offer of company. Walking? A good thing to blow the smoke out of one's head. Now that woman... Now that women have taken to tobacco, we live in a bath of nicotine. It would be a curious thing to study the effects of cigarettes on the relation of the sexes. Smoke is almost as great a solvent as divorce. Both tend to obscure the moral issue. Nothing could have been less consonant with Selden's mood than Van Alstyne's after-dinner aphorisms. But, as long as the latter confined himself to generalities, his listeners' nerves were in control. Happily, Van Elsting prided himself on his summing up of social aspects, and with Selden for an audience was eager to show the sureness of his touch. Mrs. Fitcher lived in an east side street near the park, and as the two men walked down Fifth Avenue, the new architectural developments of that versatile thoroughfare invited Van Elsing's comment. That greener house now, a typical rung in the social ladder, the man who built it came from a melu where all the dishes are put on the table at once. His facade is complete architectural meal. If he had admitted his style, his friends might have thought the money had given out. Not a bad purchase for Rosedale, though. Attracts attention and awes the western sightseer. By and by, he'll get out of that phase. Want something that the crowd will pass and the few pause and the few pause before. Especially if he marries my clever cousin. Selden dashed with an in with a query. And the Wellington Brise? Rather clever of its kind, don't you think? They were just beneath the white, the wide white facade with its rich restraint of line, which suggested the clever corsetting of a redundant figure. That's the next stage, the desire to imply that one has been to Europe and has a standard. I'm sure Mrs. Bry thinks her house a copy of the Tryon. In America, every marble house with gilt furniture is thought to be a copy of the Tryon. What a Clever chap that architect is, though, how he takes his client's measure. He has put the whole of Mrs. Bry in his use of the composite order. Now for the Trenners. You remember he chose the Corinthian. Exuberant, but based on the best precedent. The Trenner house is one of his best things. Doesn't look like the banqueting hall turned inside out. I hear Mrs. Trenner wants to build out a new ballroom, and that diverges from Gus on that point. He keeps her at a Bel Belmont. The dimensions of the bride's ballroom must rankle. You may be sure she knows them as well as if she'd been there last night with a yard measure. Who said she was in town, by the way? That fairish boy? She isn't, I know. Mrs. Stepney was right. The house is dark. You see, I suppose Gus lives in the back. He had halted opposite the Trenner's corner, and Selden perforce stayed his steps also. 
The house loomed obscure and uninhabited. Only an oblong gleam above the door spoke a provisional occupancy. They bought the house at the back. It gives them a hundred and fifty feet in the side street. There's where the ballroom's to be, with a gallery connecting its billiard room, billiard, billiard room and so upon above. I suggest, the change, I suggest changing the entrance and carrying the drawing room across the whole Fifth Avenue front. You see, the front door corresponds with the windows. The walking stick, stick which Van Elsing swung in demonstration, dropped at a startled hello as the door opened and two figures were seen silhouetted against the hall light. At the same moment, a hansom at the curbstone and one of the figures floated down to it in a haze of evening draperies, while the other, black and bulky, remained persistently projected against the light. For an immeasurable second, the two spectators of the incident were silent. Then the house door closed. The hansom rolled off, and the whole scene slipped by as if with a turn of a, of a stereo, stereo opticon. Van Elsting dropped his eyeglass with a low whistle. Ahem! Nothing of this, eh, Selden? As one of the family, I know I may count on you. Appearances are deceptive, and Fifth Avenue is so imperfectly lighted. Good night, said Selden, turning sharply down the side street without seeing the other's extended hand.